Hi everyone, this is Ezekiel O'Callaghan with Raptor Chatter, and we're going to be looking at what happened in June 2021 in paleontology. And so without any further ado, let's get started. Pelicaniformes is a group that includes a lot of different birds, and it actually started just after the KPG extinction. And so some of the first diverging members were things like the herons and the ibises, but then later other animals, such as the hammercop, which is functionally very similar to herons, and then also the shoebill stork, which is also functionally very similar to herons. And then finally you get to Pelicanidae, or the pelicans. So it's a whole bunch of waders, and then very suddenly towards the end of this group, pelicans. A new species of fossil pelican named Eopelicanus aegyptiacus is the oldest known member of Pelicanidae, and you might have gotten this from the name, but it comes from Egypt, and specifically from the same group of information that we actually find a lot of Bacillosaurus fossils, and Bacillosaurus was an early whale, so we actually can understand that these animals were evolving at right around the same time. This time period correlates to the late Eocene, so you know by at least that point, the modern diversity that we do see in Pelicaniformes had already evolved, and so it's very probable at least that the other groups already did exist in the fossil record too, although we may not have all of those fossils just yet. And as for fossils and other groups that help us to understand the broader diversity of a group, we have a new fossil crocodilian coming from Australia. And this might seem not that exciting because crocodilians are actually one of the groups people most think of when associating an animal with Australia. But so far it's only been understood that two groups actually made it to Australia. And those would be the ancestors to the freshwater and saltwater crocodiles and another group that's now extinct, the Mekosukines. The Mekosukines were land-based, and they actually lived up until just a few thousand years ago, meaning they would have interacted with some of the first people to actually make it to Australia. But beyond that, this new fossil isn't either of those groups. It's a Tomisomine, which means it's very closely related to the false gario, or at least closer related to the false gario than any other modern crocodilians are today. The new species was named Gungan Marandu Manala, and comes from only 2 million years ago, so not that long in geologic time, although it did go extinct before humans showed up on the continent, at least probably. But while I said this animal was very closely related to the false gari, or closer than other crocodilians were, it's still separated by a lot of time, almost 50 million years to its closest relative in the group, Tomistomine. So while this animal was a Tomistomine, and its closest modern relative would be the false gari, it still wasn't that closely related, because the Tomistomines actually had a lot of diversity, including its closest relative to Gungan Maru, which came from Europe over 50 million years ago. That animal was Dolosuchoides, and coming from Europe, that means there's a massive gap in the geologic record for how these animals migrated from Europe into Australia, and that means there may be dozens of more fossils that we could try and find from this specific lineage to try and understand how they got from point A to point B. There were also a number of papers this month looking at trackways and trace fossils in the geologic record, and one of these actually looked at dinosaurs that were walking through large sand dunes. This paper talks about South American trace fossils, and the most interesting thing about it isn't necessarily the track makers themselves, but rather how they were identified. And that's because most of the time when you see trace fossils laid out, they're on a flat slab where you can see the indentation into the sediments. This isn't the case for this particular formation though, because most of the outcrops for this formation are essentially cut in half. And that means you're instead of getting the top view of a footprint, you're getting the side view. And so you have to try and understand how different things like underprints are formed in order to identify these kinds of trackways. An underprint is essentially the soft sediment deformation that happens when an animal walks across multiple layers of sediment and doesn't necessarily punch through all of them. So what we can imagine is essentially if there's three layers of sediment and the animal punches through three layers, the weight of that animal is still going to shift the lower layers even if it didn't necessarily touch those layers. And that kind of deformation of those lower layers are the underprints that these authors are specifically talking about. Now, the reason they're able to say that these are dinosaur footprints is because it's from the right time during the Cretaceous, and also there's not really a whole lot of other animals that were that large that it could be from. So it's very likely that these were dinosaur-made footprints, although we'll never technically know for sure unless we're able to do some incredible, incredible 3D imaging or something of these trackways. Another paper looked at mammal trackways in Tuff, and that's T-U-F-F. Tough. And tough is a very strange rock to get fossils in because it's generally very soft and also it's volcanic, so most animals don't necessarily want to hang around when tuff is being formed. And tuff can be formed in two ways essentially. The first is pyroclastic flow. So if you think of the Mount St. Helens eruption, that's a very large pyroclastic flow. The other is ashfall, 
And so if you think of some of the volcanoes that have erupted in Iceland where they shoot up giant ash plumes, where those deposits are the thickest, that will also form a tough layer. But again, these are soft and not necessarily that likely to preserve fossils, but sometimes they do, or at least they preserve trace fossils, and what animals were walking across the tuff as it was being deposited. These fossils come from Old Duvai Gorge, very close to where the first hominins are found, and only 1.8 million years ago, so also at the same time that those first hominins were actually around. These prints aren't hominin though, instead they're actually from artiodactyls, so animals with an even number of toes on their hooves, so things like camels or buffalo. This is actually really unique because it helps us understand what other animals that were living alongside the earliest hominins would have actually been, and hopefully can help us to understand what the greater environment that humans eventually evolved in was actually like. And again, this is largely due to the very unique preservation occurrences that are happening here, because again, tuff isn't very likely to preserve fossils, although there is at least one other older tuff formation that does preserve some fossils, and you may hear a little bit about that in the future. Another trackway actually has something to do with one of the things I did an entire separate video on, and that's the Winton Formation. And the Winton Formation is in Australia, and there's a large number of dinosaurs that are actually found in this formation. But most of the trackways have basically been theropod and ornithopod dinosaurs. Now though, there's at least some more diversity to this. And in fact, it's a lot more diversity, including things that aren't even dinosaurs. The new site also does include those theropod and ornithopods, but it also includes things like sauropods, crocodilians, axinoropterygians, or ray-finned fish, and some lungfish feeding traces. So it helps to show that there's a very diverse fauna present in the Winton Formation, and that we shouldn't be limited to just what we find in the fossil record, or as far as body fossils are concerned. There's more diversity than just body fossils. Additionally, the sauropod prints may be totally unique, at least unique enough to give them their own scientific name, although it's really hard to tell because they are somewhat poorly preserved. A lot of this is based on the fact that some of them do appear to still have the thumbprint, some sauropods had a large thumb claw, and it seems like that mostly evolved out of the Australian sauropods, although it has been suggested in one, Diamantinosaurus. So these prints may actually correspond to that specific animal, although it's really hard to tell because they are poorly preserved. Hopefully there will be more fossils coming out of this site though, so we can try and get a better understanding of what was happening with the sauropods. Regardless of this though, it does help us to understand the broader diversity and very complex ecosystems that were present in the river plains of central Australia during the Cretaceous. There were also a number of trackways coming from China, the first two in the Sichuan province and specifically in the Jiaguan formation. Now this formation is known for having a lot of theropod tracks but not really any bodies, and this still holds even with these new fossils. These are theropod tracks, and they're really poorly preserved so it's hard to say exactly what was happening, and part of that might also just be because they were found in very unique locations. One was essentially on a cliffside, and the other was in a cave. But it is helpful to show that there are fossils that can be found in many different places, and it's important for us geologically to go and explore as many of these places as we can, so we can try and find more unique fossils in the future. The other set of tracks also comes from the Jiaguan Formation, but this comes from just across the border from the Xishan province in Guizhou. These are also theropod tracks, but these ones we can actually say at least what they probably belong to, and that's the raptor dinosaurs, and that's because they only have two toes. In general, theropod tracks are really hard to try and tell apart because it's essentially a three-toed foot with claws at the end. But because the raptors very distinctly held up their sickle toe claw, it makes it very easy to identify their footprints in the fossil record. So we can say with some confidence there was some type of raptor dinosaur in the Cretaceous in central China. And that's even despite not having any real body fossils from this part of China for that time period. And now on the subject of raptor dinosaurs or dromaeosaurs, there was a new one described named Canciagnathus Sogdianus, coming from a Soviet expedition to Tajikistan in the 60s. Now, this paper is still in Russian, so I can't quite look at all of it. However, from what I was able to translate, it does seem like it is its very legitimate own genus, and that's because it had 12 avioli in the jaw, and that's different than the numbers we see in other dromaeosaurs. Now, avioli are essentially just where the tooth would have fit its tooth sockets. So it's not anything that's wildly complex, but the number of them is very diagnostic, at least within some dromaeosaurs. It was also closely related to Velociraptor, as in it was a Velociraptorine dromaeosaur, although it lived about 10 to 15 million years before Velociraptor, although still in large parts of Central Asia, meaning that there may be a consistent pattern of these very small or relatively small turkey-sized dromaeosaurs showing up in this part of Central Asia during the Cretaceous. So earlier this month, I also had a video on Burmese amber and the ethics surrounding it. And this was under the lens of two papers, and so now I'm actually going to talk about the science in those papers as opposed to just 
the ethics of those papers, which you should absolutely check out. I really like that video and I think it's a very important subject. As for the papers, the first one didn't have any ethics statement, and so I'm not going to go as far into it. This paper described a new species of fossil bird. It was named Fortipazavis prehendens, and beyond that I'm not really going to discuss too much about it because of the ethics issues surrounding this paper. The other paper though did have an ethics statement, and what it found is actually pretty interesting because it has to do with a fossil found last year, Oculodentavis. Oculodentavis was originally described as the smallest bird in the fossil record, and immediately a lot of people pointed out that that's probably not a bird. And this new paper actually describes a new species of the genus Oculodentavis, this one being Oculodentavis naga. The new species of Oculodentavis, Oculodentavis naga, has a much different skull shape than the older species, Oculodentavis congrae. And it does help to show that the genus did also have more lizard-shaped skulls as opposed to the more bird-like skull of congrae. However, there's also seven other features that were found in Naga that helped to suggest it was actually a lizard. And a lot of these have to do with cranial kinesis. Cranial kinesis is something that's very common in the lizards, but less common in the early birds. What happens is essentially many different parts of the skull and the different skull bones can move relative to one another. The snakes, which are technically lizards, actually take this to the largest extreme, with their skulls being able to very far deform themselves in order to swallow very large items of prey. This still happens to some degree in lizards, although just a smaller degree. The early birds though didn't have this, instead having a more solid and rigid skull, much like the dinosaurs had. And so this is a really good indication that Oculodentavis wasn't actually a bird, but instead is actually a lizard. And now looking at the extinction that killed the non-avian dinosaurs, there's been a lot of evidence that has suggested that most environments were pretty stable during the late Cretaceous, and then suddenly they got hit by a giant rock from space. But overall, without that rock, they probably would have sailed on just fine. A new paper though looked at this through the lens of biodiversity, so essentially how diverse and how speciose are the dinosaurs during this time period. And they found that about 10 million years before the impact, there's actually a pretty significant drop in diversity. They essentially ran the data through modeling software that was used to estimate how speciose and how much speciation should have been occurring during this last 10 million years and found that it was essentially much lower than what they had found via this model. And no model is perfect, but it's at least a starting baseline to try and work with. I do think though, some of their data might have been off based on the six families they actually used. And that's because there were a lot more families still around, such as the Alvarosaurus and some Titanosaurus like Alamosaurus, which were still around on North America at this time. But then in addition to that, you have some animals like the Abelosaurus, which were very successful and common in South America and parts of Africa. Unfortunately for those South American animals though, South America was only mentioned once in the entire paper, and it was basically to just go, well, we don't actually know how old these fossils actually are. And that's because a lot of the formations in South America haven't been very reliably dated to specific time periods in the Cretaceous. And that's no fault of the authors. Those studies just haven't been completed. But it does mean that essentially some of their data for those parts of the animals might be a little bit off. This same kind of thing happens in parts of Mongolia and Asia, where they essentially say this formation we're just assigning to this specific stage in the Cretaceous. And so it's kind of a weak setup to just try and say, we think it's about this age. There's some constraints that should be placed on this paper. And I think the most accurate one would be to say that biodiversity decreased in North America. And that does seem pretty accurate because honestly, the hadrosaurs became very, very rich in diversity and numbers during the latest Cretaceous. And it seems like they may have actually pushed out some of the other herbivores. So there's a good chance that biodiversity was decreasing at least in most groups, although the hadrosaurs may have actually had an increase in that diversity. And as for theropod diversity, there was a new paper that actually suggested something that might feed into that other paper, and that's how the tyrannosaurs became so dominant, or at least how their dominance affected biodiversity. And that's because what this paper found is that in multiple environments where tyrannosaurs weren't necessarily at their largest sizes yet, they were still mid-sized theropods, there was a lot of diversity in different sizes of other theropods. So for example, in some formations in China, you have things like Guanlong, one of the first tyrannosaurs. But in that formation, there's also animals like Zuolong and Monolophosaurus, with the dominant predator being Sinoraptor, which is actually a metriacanthosaurid, which is most closely related to the Allosauroids. However, towards the later Cretaceous, many tyrannosaurs became absolutely dominant, and not just Tyrannosaurus rex. This also includes animals like Zuchang Tyrannus and Tarbosaurus, both from Asia. So it's also not limited to just North America. And what we do find in those formations as well is that there's essentially a large gap of mid-sized theropod dinosaurs that's just entirely gone. And it's very likely these niches were filled by the smaller juvenile tyrannosaurs 
However, that's going to take a little bit more research to try and understand. There was also another paper that I missed from earlier this year that actually applied the same size gap in the Hell Creek formation to the African savanna of today. And what they found is in the African savanna of today, it would essentially be equivalent to having one lion and then bat-eared foxes as the next largest predator. So again, missing a huge swath of middle-sized predators that would have filled the environment. And so the Tyrannosaurus very much may have had a significant effect on biodiversity. So that does help support that previous paper quite a bit. And moving from very large Tyrannosaurs and dinosaurs into something much smaller, salamanders. And specifically, a group of salamanders called the Hynobiidae. The Hynobiidae is actually really closely related to the cryptobranchids, and this includes animals like the Chinese and Japanese giant salamanders and also the hellbender of the Appalachian Mountains. But the Hynobiidae aren't quite as primitive looking, and I don't like the term primitive because those other animals still need it here just the same. But they look much more like you would expect a traditional salamander to look like. The important thing for understanding evolutionarily, though, is that this group of salamanders, the cryptobranchids, and the Hynobiidae actually broke off from the other salamanders pretty early on, and they actually have a different form of reproduction, essentially still using very traditional methods of reproduction, as opposed to what many other salamanders do with external fertilization. So for animals like the Pleurodonts, the male will drop a packet outside of his body, and then the female picks that up and fertilizes the eggs that way. A new fossil species of Hynobiidae named Nemegtriton dauhuguensis helps to show how some of the hip anatomy changes in these different, essentially, fertilization methods. This is because this animal had a high number of caudosacral vertebra, so essentially vertebra that connect to the hips and the tail. And so this essentially helps facilitate this more direct method of fertilization. This is different than we see in other groups of salamanders, which actually reduce the number of their caudosacral vertebra in order to achieve essentially these other forms of fertilization. And this actually falls in line with what we see as an overall trend in the amphibians, or at least some amphibians. So this fossil essentially suggests a trend of losing caudosacral vertebra in the amphibians. And this includes even in older amphibians, or at least stem amphibians like the tennis which had more caudosacral vertebra than even the hynobiidae, but then the hynobiidae having more caudosacral vertebra than the later salamanders. So this is potentially a trend we can try and use to understand where specific salamander fossils actually came from in the fossil record. And also real quick, since this one was preserved so well, they actually were able to do a CT scan of the skull. And a lot of times people talk about these fossils being very flattened, and so you don't have a lot of the 3D imagery of it. And you can absolutely see it in this 3D scan of the skull. It is very much just a smear in a piece of paper almost. There was also research on amphibians that helped to understand Dolo's law of irreversibility in the fossil record. Dolo's law essentially states that once an animal loses a complex feature, it's not very likely to re-evolve that feature. And this has been brought up about teeth specifically. And frogs are a great case study of this because there's been 20 times in the fossil record that they've been shown to entirely lose their teeth. This is mostly associated with beginning to take very small prey, but at least one frog species was able to grow teeth back or evolve teeth back on both the upper and lower jaws. However, this is only one species out of 7,000 species. So while it does seem like it throws a bit of a wrench into Dolo's Law, it does seem still pretty consistent that Dolo's Law should be applied in most cases. However, it does mean that it's not necessarily completely a law, and it's just a small part of the larger picture that we should get through the evolutionary lens. Elephants are the largest animals on land today, but that wasn't always the case, specifically because there was a very large group of hornless rhinos, and the largest of these was Parasitherium, which actually has a number of different species, and a new species of it was actually described from central China. Named Parasitherium linziensi, it helps essentially fill in a gap of how this genus started in Mongolia most likely, and then migrated through parts of China and eventually down to Pakistan, where the largest species lived. And this new species is actually found to be pretty closely related to that large Pakistani species. And it does help to essentially help us understand how the overall group of Paraceratherium started to evolve and how in some different places they were essentially able to take advantage of different resources to achieve massive sizes. With gaps in evolution, there was a significant gap that was very long misunderstood. This was during the Permian and is called Olson's Gap because the researcher Olson was the first person to recognize it. What he found was that there's essentially a very large gap between the Polycosaurs and the Theraspids during the Middle Permian. And the Polycosaurs were very, very stem mammals, and the Theraspids were just stem mammals, essentially. So they were closer to mammals, but still not quite there yet. And the Polycosaurs were even earlier diverging from the mammals than the Theraspids were. A new look at the fossil Roranimus has helped us understand that there actually are some fossils that do fill in this gap, 
And that's because this fossil is very incomplete. It's essentially just the tip of a snout. But by using CT scanning, they were able to find some internal features that do align with the polycosaurs and some features that do align with the thraspids, essentially helping to bridge Olshlin's gap and helping us to understand the broader diversity and evolutionary trends that did eventually lead to the mammals. And moving back into dinosaurs, there was also the record of one of the earliest abelosaurs. And the reason I say one of the earliest is because it might actually be the earliest. A lot of this depends on what Eoabelosaurus was. And Eoabelosaurus, despite the name, may have actually been a ceratosaur, which is closely related, but still not quite the same thing. This fossil, though, is distinctly the first known abelosaur, and does come from the late Jurassic of South America. This means that by at least the late Jurassic, they were a very distinct part of South American faunal groups. And additionally, since they became so successful, especially in South America and parts of Africa during the latest Cretaceous, understanding their origins may have important implications for how biogeography works, essentially how animals are able to migrate and fill different niches, especially as one of the most distinctive features of South American fauna is that they essentially are missing a lot of the solarosaurs we see in the Northern Hemisphere. So things like a lot of the dromaeosaurs, although it depends on where their unologians are, but then things like the tyrannosaurs or gallimimiforms. So there's a very big difference in essentially what these faunas were when the continents started to split apart. And there could be a very important part of why the abelosaurs ended up more significant in parts of South America, Africa, and potentially even Australia, although we don't have those fossils just yet. So earlier in June, I made a video about a Chinese hadrosauroid that was found by the Soviets in the 1920s. And it was essentially as close as you could get to a hadrosaur without technically being a hadrosaur. And now there's another one, although this one comes from the exact opposite side of Eurasia, coming from Spain. Thylax thyracolossus was a new species and genus of non-hadrosaur hadrosauroid coming from Spain's Figueroa formation. And this is actually slightly closer to the modern day than the animal that was found in China was actually from. And this is a very minute change because they're both from the Maastrichtian stage of the Cretaceous, although Thylax is from the end of it and the other species is from the beginning of it. And unfortunately for us, Phylax is actually very partial, essentially only being known from a single dentary bone, and that's essentially the lower mandible. However, it does have enough features to help us identify that it is a totally unique animal. These include things like the length versus the width of the teeth being compared to each other, and then a joint process being a certain length when compared to the dental battery, which is essentially just where the teeth form a surface on the jaw. There have actually been a lot of non hadrosaur hadrosauroids described in the last few years, and it helps us understand that they were probably more diverse than we actually thought, and that it wasn't just the hadrosaurs becoming very successful. The hadrosaurs just had a lot of success, where a lot of the first fossil finds were actually happening. And actually, one of these non hadrosaur hadrosauroids was actually found to be the closest relative to Phylax, and that's Tethys hadros, which actually makes a lot of sense because it's from Italy, so biogeographically, these two animals are relatively close to one another. The researchers also took this biogeographical concept a step further, and essentially looked at all of the different hadrosauroid fossils that they had to try and understand where the group may have actually originated. And what they found is it probably actually originated in Appalachia, in the North American continent. And then these animals were able to essentially migrate across Iberia and then into Europe and then across to Asia. And this makes sense because the continents were a lot closer together in Pangaea, and there's been some good evidence for Iberia specifically still being connected to North America for a longer period than the rest of Europe, and then it eventually did meet up with the rest of Europe. And then once they did get to Asia, that's probably where we get the first true hadrosaurs, because there's a lot of them there, and that does make sense that they would have first radiated there and then migrated northwards across the Bering Land Bridge and then into North America, where they then took over that continent. So the Pachycephalosaurs are strange because they have giant domed heads, in one of the Jurassic Park movies, they actually mention it as Friar Tuck because it looks kind of like some of the old friars did in some of the old churches. However, there's been a lot of discussion about essentially what they were using this large domed head for. There's essentially been two main arguments for this. Were they trying to essentially defend themselves from predators or was it interspecies competition? And this paper suggested it was probably interspecies competition based on the damage that actually happened to these domes. Previous work using CT scans has actually also suggested this, but this new work actually used thin sections. So essentially they cut the dome in half, ground it down very thin so light could pass through, and they were able to try and identify different features on the bone that would have been caused from different things. And what they found is actually a lot of very, very small indentations in the bone. And this is probably because they were running into one another. The paper also found that a lot of the blood vessels shifted away from the top of the skull, essentially not promoting new growth. And this makes a lot of sense that these animals are running into each other quite a bit. 
because it's not something that you would really necessarily need in order to maintain it if you are only trying to attack predators. Essentially, the more consistent impacts against their own species is probably what drove the evolution of these giant bony domes. There are also new finds of very, very young dinosaurs coming from Alaska. And this has been up for a lot of debate, essentially, how much did the Alaskan dinosaurs actually stay there? Did they migrate away in the winter? And because of the wealth of fossils that have been found in Alaska, especially of these juvenile dinosaurs, there's pretty solid evidence that at least most of the dinosaurs we have there probably stayed there year round. This idea is based around the idea that most of these dinosaurs wouldn't necessarily be having their young in the cold unless they too were staying there year round. Essentially, they would be more likely to breed in the south where it was warmer and then eventually migrate back north, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Instead, based on these juvenile fossils and very, very young nestling fossils, it's much more likely they were there year round. It's also probable that the northern populations had slightly different life histories. And what that means is essentially they just had different strategies to try and cope, even if they were the same species or genus as other animals that lived elsewhere in the continent. As an example, Edmontosaurus has been found both in Alaska, but also throughout a lot of Canada and even parts of the US. So it's a very, very widespread animal. But the northern population that's found in Alaska probably had at least some different strategies to try and cope with the extreme cold, or at least greater cold that would have been present in Alaska during the Cretaceous in the winter. There was also a new fossil bird found, and it wasn't actually named as a new genus or species, although it probably is, and its current name, which is specimen IVPPV12707, doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. So we're just gonna call it the bird for this part of the paper. Now, if you remember me talking about kinetic skulls earlier in this video during the Oculin and Tavis part, this bird actually still had that more rigid skull-like structure of the archosaurs, rather than the more flexible skull structures we see in later birds. And so this helps to show that essentially, during a lot of the early growth of birds and evolution of birds, there was a lot of flexibility in how the skull could have actually been shaped. And so if certain groups didn't go extinct, we may have entirely different kinds of looking birds than we actually have today. It also suggests that a lot of the flexibility that we see in modern bird skulls co-evolved with the bill, and that's because this bird didn't necessarily quite have a bill. It still had teeth, and the bill may have been starting to evolve, but additionally, it had a hard, dense upper palate. And that essentially helps to provide a lot of rigidity to the skull. Later birds essentially softened this palate so they could get more dexterous maneuverability out of their beaks. And now we're going to be moving into papers that I did entirely separate videos. So if you want more about these different fossils, you can go check out those videos on their own. The first paper is going to be that non-hadrosaur, hadrosauroid that I mentioned earlier. And this one was called Tanius sinensis. Tanius had one very specific feature that was completely unique, and that's essentially the two epicondyles, essentially where the bones rub up against each other on the femur. Those were entirely enclosing a tendon or a muscle ligament. And again, this is something we don't see anywhere else. It's a very strange kind of tunnel through the bone that is just entirely unique. In addition, because it's a non-hadrosaur, hadrosauroid, it does help to show that the hadrosauroids still did relatively successful across Eurasia. Even if they didn't necessarily make it into North America, they were still very populous and shouldn't be ignored from many studies that are looking at the biodiversity that was occurring during the latest Cretaceous. There was also a paper on the largest dinosaur ever found from Australia, and it's been named Australotitan, which makes sense because it's from Australia and it was a titan, potentially being as large as some of the largest dinosaurs known, things like Argentinosaurus or Puertosaurus. This is a really exciting find because most of the largest sauropods are actually known from Argentina and other parts of South America. So Australia having its own distinct lineage of very, very large up to 100 foot or 30 meter long sauropods is entirely unique and helps to show that their environments were actually very complex throughout the Cretaceous. There was also a paper that looked at Amphicelius, which has been a very long known sauropod. It was actually found in the 1800s during the Bone Wars between Marsh and Cope, where each one of them was essentially trying to prove the other wrong and find more dinosaurs. Amphicelius is interesting though, because it's very fragmentary, and it might actually have been completely the same animal as Diplodocus. This new paper though, essentially looked at the limited fossils that we do have of Amphicelius, and did find that it is its own genus. And this is really important because a lot of people have argued that there may be too many sauropods in the Morrison Formation of North America in which it was found. However, because there's still this greater diversity, that means that instead of there being too many sauropods, the Morrison Formation just had a lot of them. And this makes sense because it was laid down and deposited over a very long time scale. It was essentially a river system running through an arid or semi-arid environment. And this would have laid down a little bit of sediment every single year. The Morrison Formation can be up to 200 meters thick, 
So that means that's 200 meters of very fine deposition of different sediments year by year by year. And so it makes sense that there could actually be this many different sauropods within the Morrison Formation because the Morrison Formation takes up a broad swath of the Western United States and additionally would have spent millions of years being deposited. So not all the sauropods found in the Morrison Formation were necessarily living alongside one another. It's more likely that one species died out and then another one moved in. So it's not at all saying that they were all living together at the same time. There was also a study which used 3D prints using specialized materials to try and estimate the bite forces in juvenile Tyrannosaurus rex. And what it found is that relatively early on, they would start being able to actually start scratching bone, although not necessarily showering it the way the adults probably could. But this does mean they could potentially start eating some of the smaller bones and start participating in osteophagy, which is eating bone behavior. Additionally, there was some evidence that the juvenile Tyrannosaurus may have actually taken a few nips at one another, and these aren't the same kind of feeding traces that we find. Instead, it's something that's more akin to certain crocodilians essentially nipping at each other and jousting for position in the area in which they're resting. And this is because crocodilians will essentially just lay out on a bank very close to one another and will still kind of joust for position. And so there's at least some evidence now that potentially some Tyrannosaurus did something like that, or at least they did when they were young, potentially living in small groups and essentially then spreading out and diversifying to their own territories once they got older although that's gonna be really, really hard to try and identify in the fossil record. There's also an indication that the impact at the end of the Cretaceous actually increased productivity in the oceans, but only after essentially a honeymoon period after the impact. Although honeymoon normally means good things and the first few years after the impact were pretty poor. These researchers used complex modeling techniques to essentially predict what we would expect to see in the oceans after such an impact occurred. And what it found is that although a lot of the sun was blocked out and that would have lowered productivity for just a few years after the impact, once the sunlight was able to reach the oceans again, productivity would have skyrocketed. And that's because this impact would have stirred up a lot of the deep sea sediments and released a lot of nutrients back into the water column. So essentially, once these nutrients got brought back up into the water column, different types of organisms were able to take advantage of those nutrients. And this also means that this may have helped the recovery happen even faster, at least in the oceans. There's a lot of other stuff that this paper does go into about how this may have occurred and specifically what types of elements were very beneficial to this recovery. And so you can check out this specific video for all of those details. So when I mentioned the Tomistomene from Australia, I mentioned that it's basically just a piece of a skull. And it's important to remember that crocodilians are more than just a skull, even though a lot of crocodilian work is only focused on the skull. One of the groups that this is included is the Allodaposuchids, which is a very interesting group of crocodilians or near crocodilians. It's not been well established whether or not they were inside or just outside of crocodilia, essentially the lineages that led to modern crocodilians. This paper used a lot of the postcranial material, so the body material, to establish that, yeah, they probably were true crocodilians. In fact, the Allodaposuchids seem to fit in really nicely just about between the Gavialoids, which are animals like the Gariel, and the Brevorostris, which is Alligatoridae, alligators and caiman, and Crocodilidae, which is the crocodiles. So while there is a bias in a lot of paleontological work to essentially study the most interesting parts of an animal, it is important that we do actually look at the whole animal so that we can get a better understanding of what specifically was happening in the evolutionary record. There was also a description of the oldest known dinosaur in the fossil record, and this isn't old in geologic time, it's old in the fact that this dinosaur was very old. It was, it was practically ancient by dinosaur standards. In fact, it grew to become so old that we can't actually tell how old it was. And that's because while well, we do understand that a lot of different dinosaurs essentially had growth rings that would have essentially added one probably every year, this animal became so old that it needed to remodel the bone. And so essentially new bone cells grew over these growth rings, essentially destroying the record of how old it may have been. Additionally, it had calcium pyrophosphate disease, which causes a lot of arthritis-like symptoms. And so this is something we really don't find in the fossil record. Most dinosaurs and most animals in the wild, honestly, don't get to achieve these kinds of old ages where these kinds of diseases show up regularly because if it has arthritis, it's probably gonna end up getting hunted and eaten. Fortunately for us though, this animal didn't get eaten. And so that means we have a very good record of what we should expect to see in very old dinosaurs in the future. And so potentially we might be able to find a few more of these in the fossil record. The video that I did do on this paper does go into a lot more detail about the different features that the researchers did find that did lead them to conclude that it is the oldest known dinosaur. Although at the same time, it is still kind of funny just to imagine a kind of old arthritic dinosaur hobbling around on a walker. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. We are going to have a busy week coming up. I did interviews with 
two researchers who study sharks. That's Dr. Dana Errett and Dr. Bobby Bosenecker. Again, they study sharks, so I interviewed them and talked to them because Shark Week's coming up. So we talked about some of the different fossil sharks that exist, essentially how a lot of these animals would have probably been behaving, um, and some of like the effort that goes into the research that they're that they were working on. There'll also be another video that I'm going to do on some of the weird Paleozoic air quotes sharks because some of those things are really weird, but a lot of them aren't actually technically sharks, depending on how you define shark. And then finally, we are actually going to be trying to do a podcast between myself, who knows a lot about paleontology, my wife, who has learned some stuff about paleontology through me, and a friend of ours who can name three dinosaurs, and one of those dinosaurs is the pigeon? So, <laughs> I mean, he at least knows birds are dinosaurs, but that's only because I've probably drilled it into him. So yeah, you're going to probably be getting a lot more content from us in the future. You can check out the Patreon for some of the extra benefits that are going to be going with the podcast once we actually launch it. And so with that in mind, everyone, be safe, take care, and don't go extinct.